So hello everyone. Today we are meeting a special guest, Steve Cadigan, a highly sought after talent advisor to organizations such as Google, Salesforce, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and the BBC. Top VC and consulting firms like McKinsey regularly retain him for insight. In 2021, Steve was recognized as top 200 global thought leaders in the world of people and talent. He was the first Chief Human Resource Officer of LinkedIn, VP of Human Resource of Electronic Arts, Director Human Resource of Cisco, and HR Manager of AMD. And in the last but not the least, he is the author of a book called Work Quake. I highly recommend this book. It's a small and a quick read, and I'm sure it will help you. So Steve, I want to start with thanking you for three things. First is you giving us the opportunity to uh, speak to you and ask a few questions. Second, for writing this great, small, and concise book. Why I say concise and small? Because now I'm reading a book on architecture. It's like 1,200 pages, and I can see the author is just filling the pages after pages too because his publisher said so. So thank you for writing a very concise book. And the last thank you for keeping it so low cost that anyone can afford it. So really, thank you very much for writing that book and keeping it affordable. Well, thank you so much for having me and uh, keeping the cost low and, and making sure that the message gets out to a broad audience. Uh, leads to opportunities like this. So it, I love talking about the future of work and trying to help other people navigate what feels like a very complicated future. And so, yeah, I really right. welcome the opportunity. So in your book, you talk about turning your culture for your own advantage. And it costs nothing. So that was very a uh, highlighting highlighted sentence that it costs nothing. So let's start with what is great culture, how you define it, and how you can measure it. Can we quantify this thing? And what we can do to build a great culture? Great question. And you're starting uh, in one of my favorite domains. You know, the, the, the world of uh, culture, or even just the word culture, I think is very um, up to interpretation. Uh, it varies. It, like humans, we, you know, humans compose cultures and because we are complex, organic creatures always changing, uh, cultures are sometimes hard to, hard to get a hold of. And when I think about culture from an organization perspective, I, I think about it in terms of how do we create an environment where we can produce the best possible outcomes for everybody in the ecosystem, customers, uh, investors, employees, leaders, individual contributors. And that's hard because it's always changing and always in motion. And, and as we're recording this today, we are still in the midst of a, of a pandemic and we're seeing every culture and every organization face more substantive changes than ever before. But I think the, the value, the reason why this is so important uh, holds up even outside of cultural times and maybe even more so in, in times like now. And when it starts, I think, to hit leaders the most uh, in terms of why this is important is when you're starting to grow and people are facing having to make a decision without the opportunity of immediate input from, from other people in other locations. So I need to make a call. Do I go X or Y? And I'm not really sure how I should make that decision. That's when the culture can really be helpful. You know, if we're looking for a big deal or we're looking for a deal that's gonna to lead to bigger deals tomorrow. And what the cultural norms are in the organization should help inform how to make a better decision. And I think the, the clearer you are with that, the more helpful it is, the bigger you become because people just have a general understanding of we're gonna lean this way or we're gonna lean that way depending upon how it works. And there is no such thing as a right culture or a wrong culture. It really is up to the organization to help understand that. And I guess if, if wherever you are in your journey of understanding or thinking about culture, 
as an individual or as a leader, I think the best place to start is where we started at LinkedIn when we were facing this daunting challenge of trying to hire at scale. Uh, we had more mm. offer declines than we had acceptances. We had a competition for talent that was extreme. And we sat around the table as an executive team one time, and I can't remember if it was me or somebody else. Somebody in the room asked a question, why does anyone want to work here? And that is a great starting point for you to identify who you are. Um, what is your character as an organization? What are your values? What, what's important? You know, why does anyone want to work here is the beginning of a good exercise. And I would ask uh, you to consider that if you're not really sure what your culture is or why it's important. Why does someone want to work here? That's the beginning of helping, I think, reveal who you are. Mm -hmm. And, and then you can get to, well, what assets do we have here that differentiate us from every other organization in the world? What are the characteristics and components that exist here that are, that are different? So that's how, mm -hmm. I, that's how I would start to think about it. Okay. And it looks like empowerment is one of the very important aspects of the culture. The first example you were giving where employee can decide which way to go. So it's about being having empowerment of to do everything and not check with their manager for every step on the way. Well, it can, it can be. I mean, clearly, if we're in a manufacturing organization and someone's on the line in the Tesla factory, I want them to not ask questions right. and be really clear. Like, you have to do right. it this way or the car will break or if I'm in a medical device company. But I think you bring up a really, really valid and very, very significant point in the world of technology, this is the world I live in, this is the world that, that you've been brought up in. And I think in software companies and in technology companies, if you are hiring a demographic that is somewhere in the age of mid 20s to mid 30s today, I would offer, from my experience, having done this uh, in dramatic fashion probably the last 25 years of my life, is that I believe talent in that phase of their career rather would come and help create a culture than be told what the culture is. And mm. this, I think, if you're in a stage of growth, if you're in a stage of hyper growth, I think that's an attractive component that you have, that, that you want people to come in and make the culture better and help, help inform how they can deliver the best possible productivity and outcomes. Um, and clearly, mm. you know, what the pandemic has shown us above all is that people are valuing freedom, autonomy, independence over going back to an office setting. They've tasted it in, right. in a way that we've never faced before. And that's turned out to be, yeah, this is really, really important to people. So much so that all the research is saying people would rather quit because they don't want to forfeit the freedom of their time and their schedule that they realized during the pandemic, which is super interesting. True, true. You. So, um, Steve, first time I met you uh, on TikTok, <laughs> and I loved your stories of corporate America. I don't know if you remember, I sent you a message. That's how we got connected, that I really loved your stories of uh, your experiences. And in the book, uh, you said somewhere uh, that you have to be authentic more than you are right. And so I would love to know any of uh, stories from your past where you see this thing really happening and making a difference that it's more important to be authentic than to be right because we all are focused all the time to be right and perfect. Great question. And I, you know, the stories that are behind that really are from my experience working with leaders who have grown up in a model of for me to be respected, I have to always be right. For me to be respected, I can't be weak or vulnerable or look like um, I've made bad choices. I have to present a face and a facade and a presence that inspires confidence. And the belief is the more I'm right, the more people will be confidence in me. Um, mm. And the best example uh, story I can share with you was a moment at LinkedIn when we had the misfortune of being hacked by uh, a bunch of hackers. We're not sure where they, where they were from. We thought it might be Russia or China, but our system was hacked and we discovered at least several million passwords had been stolen, okay? And so 
our CEO, Jeff Weiner at the time, uh, needed to get in front of the company and we needed to start addressing this and unpacking it and try to prevent something like that from happening again in the future. And in the course of him speaking to the employees, he said a few things. He said, I think there's some things that I could have done better. I think there's some things that I, I want us to all do better. I'm sorry. Um, this was a big hit for our pathway to filing to go public and we were worried that there was going to be a confidence boost and he showed a level of emotion and vulnerability in how he talked about this that um that led to a big surprise for him we finished the company meeting and he went back to his office and i walked with him and we sat down and we were just talking about you know how did how did i think that went and what did he think about the questions we got from the employees and about did we strike the right tone and all of a sudden he looked at his inbox and it was exploding and he said hang on hang on and he started looking and people were saying because he showed a human side because he showed his true authentic self people were more mm -hmm. loyal they were more excited to work for him they respected him more as a leader and he's looked at me and he said i never thought that like i you know, I was admitting mistakes, admitting fault and things, things I could do better. And now people are more loyal of me and, fo and wanting to follow me more. And that was a great, uh, it was a great moment to be in the room with him when he saw that. And I've had other experiences like that, but that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying, you know, when you can show yourself. Now, I'm not saying be wrong, but I'm saying those moments where you can admit you were wrong, where you can admit there was a mistake, where you could admit that things could have worked better. You're going to build so much more followership than you may realize if you've never done it. That's what I was trying to get at in making that point in the book. True. Great, great advice. Yeah. And I love the concept uh, you talked about employer, brand, advocate, right? Recruiting or treating employees as they are your advocate. And every employee is your public relations person. And I see a few companies do it very well. I see like in, in, in Microsoft and Google, and we call it drinking the Kool-Aid. So whenever you even meet them outside of work, they'll only talk about, you know, work, the great product they are working on and very excited about it. But same time in Seattle, I see some very, very big tech companies, employees are there who we meet outside, but they, they, they are not that excited or passionate. Uh, so what I wonder is, uh, I would like to know a few things employer can do to turn every employee, fall in love with your company, and how you can create this amazing experience of employees, like how, uh, again, going back to that saying that drinking the Kool-Aid, what companies can do to make their employees become their brand advocates? Well, I think that's a very, it's something worth aspiring for. That's very aspirational to try to create an environment and a culture and an organization where people don't see it as a chore. They don't see it as a job. They see it's something beyond that. And I don't know mm -hmm. that you're ever going to be 100% successful uh, because everyone's changing. And someone who loves it mm -hmm. one day may have something happening at home or something happening in their personal life that may be distracting them. Uh, from realizing that or being able to park it so that they can fully immerse themselves in, the, in in finding joy in the office. So I think a starting point, I, as I said, I think it's really worth going for. And a starting point for trying to realize that is instead of when, you, when you're hiring someone, instead of beginning the conversation with why we're a great company and why our journey as an employer is really good and what we are solving – I think a great place to start is with what the journey is of the employee. Where are you in your journey? And understanding them and learning from them. Where do you want to go? And what excites you? And what are the best, you know, what are the ways that you do work that bring out the best in you? And, and this is, I think, one of the trends that, that we're starting to see for organizations that are really tapping into the, with that, that extra effort, the X factor, if you will, of their organizations mm -hmm. is when work becomes something more. And that some of the ingredients that go into that are, is the problem we are solving, does it make a difference in the world? 
And the more difference it makes, I think the more someone can tap into something beyond it's just a job. At LinkedIn, I discovered, mm. and this was the, the, the first company I worked for that had such a high aspiration and was able to articulate, articulate that really well. We would say, we're trying to help people find their dream jobs. That's why we're here. Does that excite you? Mm. And that, I would go to battle against the sexiest brands in the world, some of which you mentioned, and say, yes, that company is a great company. Yes, they're going to probably pay you more. And yes, they have more beautiful buildings. And yes, they have sushi chefs and on-site childcare. And no, I don't have those things. But the problem I'm solving is worth solving. It's never been solved. And we're starting to get data to help solve that more than anyone ever has. Are you interested in being a part of that? And we were able to start to tap into an energy and an excitement that led to this notion that you're getting at, which is how do we make work something more than, than it is? And so that's why people would, people would work longer than they might if it was just a chore. They would commit more. They would try to help other people more because it was a problem worth solving. And listen, I think every organization has that is working on something we're solving. The question is, can you articulate it? Can you express it? Mm. And can you develop that so that people become so interested that they want to be a huge part of it? And then they become, as you say, your brand ambassador. They just love it so much. Um, and mm. it's not sometimes just what you're solving. It's how you're solving it. This is another thing that I'm, I'm finding in the pandemic where people are asking mm. me, Steve, what, what's the right answer? Is it, is it back to work? Is it hybrid? Is it stay home? What's the right answer? And I said, do you know right now what's more important than the answer? It's how you make the answer, how you get to the decision. Are you going to just run away on a mountain and come down and say, this is the way it is? Or are you going to mm. ask for feedback? Are you going to ask your employees, what do you need right now? And what environment is going to produce the best for you? And we're not in a steady state. As we're, as we're having this conversation today, we have a new variant of the virus. We don't know um, how it's going to play out. And there's probably going to be another variant because of our inability to hit herd immunity as fast as we would like. So we're not in a steady state. How do we realize that? And, uh, and I think your employees are going to really respect you, admire you, and become band ambassador, brand ambassadors the more you engage them in participating and helping define what the future work circumstances should look like. Um, and, and so that's, cool. those are things, you know, if you're involving your people, things are just moving too fast, mm. I think, for leaders to be the sole decision makers today. I really think that in most organizations, I mean, you've got too much information to really pull together. So you need input from more people and you're going to make them more, I think, excited and energized if they feel a part of building the culture, they feel a part of making decisions than being told what to do. I, I truly believe that. True, true. I think it's a very, very good advice. Start with why, like why you are here, why, why this company exists, and then pay attention to how also. I think sometimes we miss one of those things. Uh, if we define the why well and articulate, and, but the how part is important too. And I think these two things has to be in place. Completely. For, for making a big impact, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Steve, I see that... Uh, of course, you have a big experience. You've worked in all these different companies, but you have very evolved thinking, I will say. And most of what you say, I completely agree. So I'm sure that's not how you must have started. <laughs> and you must have learned a lot of things on the way. So if you can share of some examples, like who shaped your thinking most, any book, any person, and, you know, any... Any experiences, if you can share with us? Yeah, you know, I I really feel, uh, in some ways, very fortunate and very surprised to in the in the world that I work in to be at the top of the mountain, uh, because I never had a plan to get there. I never said I want to be a top thought leader in my field. I want to be then you know in the best HR job in the in the world. And which I think it, when I was leading the HR function 
at LinkedIn, I think that was, there's no other job that I would want in human resources in any company. And I feel I got there. And, mm -hmm. and I look back and I say, well, how did that come about? <laughs> you know, how did this happen? And I was on a, uh, an interview recently with a firm that is 100% focused on mentoring and mentorships. And they're like, well, Steve, who was your mentor? And did you have a mentor? And I said, you know, I don't know that I had a mentor. I've had many people to guide me. Um, but if I were if I were to sort of identify a few, um, and and, and, I'll, and I'll put this out to the audience to you know think about your own journeys. When I began my journey in human resources, I did not see people above me that I wanted to be like. I didn't see they mm -hmm. had lifestyles. I didn't see they had ethics and morals that I respected, and I was very suspicious that this might not be a place for me. <laughs> I knew more leaders in human resources I didn't like and respect than I, there were that I did. And so probably the first 10 years of my career, I, I started to love what I do more, and I kept waiting for that person to appear that had the style and the lifestyle and the temperament that I thought, wow, that, that's someone I wanna be like. And finally, uh, a few landed in my in my view. And this was, uh, one was a guy named Stan Winvick, who was the leader of human resources at AMD. And another was a woman who's the first person who turned me on to uh, human resources, Jocelyn Kung. And they were both were incredible people, but they were problem solvers. They're curious. Mm. They're, they're always, you know, not looking for uh, the desire like a lot of human resource people unfortunately do. Like, well, let's build a policy for that. Let, let's, you know, let's put some, some program out there. And I'm not a policy and I'm not a program person. I'm a let's win person. And I, I mm. saw different ways of doing it. And I happen to be in a profession where I think most business executives and, and uh, you know, feel free to admit that you're in that camp if you are. I think most business executives have a greater awareness of what they don't want from human resources than what they do want. Mm. And uh, when I was building LinkedIn, for example, we had my Google refugees, my Yahoo refugees, I had my Adobe refugees. And I said, well, what would you like in a human resources agenda? Like, how would you, we're building this company, we have a chance to have soft clay, we can shape it however we want, how many levels we want, how we want to pay people, what titles we want to use, what, what uh, performance evaluation system. And they said, well, I don't want it to be this, and I don't want it to be that, and I don't want it to be this. And that's a shame. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for me because I would say, well, how about if we try this? Would you be willing to try it this way? Would you be willing to? And I was, uh, I'm very comfortable with, with change and very comfortable with experimenting. So I think that served me well. And the other person that really, uh, other people in my life, my parents, uh, and more than the cliche of, you know, my parents were great. My dad is a minister and my mom uh, is a social worker, was a social worker and ran a lot of uh, daycare resource and referral. So she would go into communities or businesses and they say, how do we handle childcare? It's a big problem. It's expensive in the United States and how do we solve it? And I loved at my parents. We would play lots of games. We would play card games, hearts, uh, I had cousins. My grandfather taught me how to play chess. I mean, we loved gaming and strategy and we're also a very competitive family. <laughs> and when you put curiosity and strategy and competition together it's a pretty cool mm. it's a pretty cool mixture i think and that was that right. was the home that i was raised in I'm, my sister as we're recording she's staying with me right now and we're we're uh, you mm. know we're strategizing what are you seeing what are you thinking and we're always looking for a better world and that's what my parents my parents when i was two years old took my older sister and i to south africa and and they mm -hmm. wanted to see an adventure and experience an adventure. And this is the late sixties and apartheid was very, very firmly grasping that country. Um, and my parents were adventurous and we were, let's go and let's have it. And they tried it for a year and fell in love with it. So we wound up staying almost five years, uh, in that country. And I think that's in my DNA. Um, when I mm. look at, you know, how do I see the world and wanting to try new things and be and, and being curious, uh, and it's easier, it's easy right. to say, and, and we can dive into that a little bit, but I think I, I would, I, I like to counter a lot of the career advice I see where people say, well, you have to go to school to learn this so you can get this job. And I'm like, well, I got the highest possible position in my profession 
when I finished school with a history degree and had no plan. I had no way mm. of knowing. I didn't even know what human resources was when I was in school or finished school. And so right. I, I believe that the, the skills I developed were the skills of communication and understanding. They're very liberal arts kind of skills. And that, I cool. think, helped, helped prepare me. And it, it's, um, my formula is not going to work for everybody, but that's sort of when I look back and reflect, and I, I don't talk about this that much, but it is, you know, it's very, it was a very kind of messy, uncertain, unclear, like, whoa, you know, I was, I was able to build a relationship with executives and companies from one firm to the next over the course of my career. Where people are like, wow, you know, you have a real talent for helping me understand something complicated or helping me work through something mm. I thought was very difficult or very emotional. And I, I, I don't know, so maybe some of those are gifts I can't even explain, but, but uh, I really love that kind of work. Right, right. And I think, the, as you said, it seems like uh, curiosity is one of your guide, which basically guided you all these different places because of your curiosity mindset or growth mindset too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, 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 of course, communication is one of the very, very important piece, I think. And as you said, you know, what worked for you may not work for others. Uh, we have to be careful that's so true to try to copy everybody in everything because, you know, I may not have your charismatic personality. And I say, okay, Steve didn't, did computer science and he did well, so I'm going to do the same thing. But you have to make sure... Uh, all other things has to be there together, right? With the curiosity, communication, and and, and hard work, and, and putting all those things together. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, you know, and following on that train, I think. I mean, everyone has a path. I, I look at careers, and I look at um, tough choices, and sometimes the hardest things we have in our career is what our parents expect us to be. You know, my parents true. look at me and say, "Where did we go wrong?" You know. He's in business. Um, and that, and, and I, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I don't think I was, it wasn't until my mid-30s when I realized I, I need to stop being what other people think I should be. And I need to mm. be something that I am. So let me unpack that a little bit and, and then reveal a couple of other things I've learned along the way for, for whatever they're worth. Which is, I love sports. I love sports. Mm. I love playing sports. I love watching sports. I love seeing how people behave in different circumstances, under pressure. How do they behave when they win? How do they behave when they lose? How do they behave with a certain coach? How do they behave when they're not the star and they used to be the star? Like, I love these things. And all of that, I realized by accident, is everything about human resources. And, um, and I got fortunate that... You know, I probably spent as much time playing pickup basketball in university, if you ask all my classmates, mm. as I did in the library. But I, I didn't realize that I was building a professional skill through my observation and trying to always think, well, what would the best combination be for this group of people or for this organization? And that, mm. you know, and, and I think what you're, what you're getting at, what you're leading me at with that question is, What are those things that you have, listener, that you really love non-professionally? Like think, don't think job. Think how do I, what gets me fired up? What kind of people make me have more energy? What, what does my pulse rise? Is it when I'm right? In, in what in what kind of settings? Is it large group settings? Is it by myself? Is it with tight deadlines? Is it with long deadlines? Is it a very complicated problem? Is it a simple problem with short deadlines? Is it involving a lot of travel? Is it involving being stay? I mean, there's so many dimensions that in our lifetime we will only be able to taste probably like one percent of the opportunities that there are for us to pursue. So what we should try to do is from one environment to another, just learn about yourself. What do I like doing? What am I good at? What do people see me uh, creating value in? And so Mm. you brought up something that I, that I want to address here, which was a big learning for me, which I think to be very true. I mean, and I've hired like you, we've both hired many people in our lives and we've coached and worked for many people, but I've hired thousands of people. And one of the things that I've observed in watching leaders and employees is that I believe great careers are built more on trust than hard work. And many of us are told, you work really hard, you're going to get ahead. Well, working really hard is very important. 
but it's mostly important because it builds trust that you become right. someone to say, I know this person can deliver. I know Steve's got the capability of following through. He's committed. I trust him. So the goal is trust. It's not the hard work. The hard work is the pathway to trust sometimes, but it's also investing in, you know, one of the things I tell people a lot, and this is one of my most viewed TikToks, is that I will tell you, having interviewed people, sometimes your value as measured by the interviewer is more the questions you ask than the answers you give. That shows curiosity. Mm. That shows your your uh, growth mindset, if you will. And if if you do a, an hour interview with someone and you say any questions, like no, no, you answered all my questions. I'm just I walk away feeling really unsatisfied. Even if your answers were mm. brilliant, like you don't you're not curious about anything. <laughs> you know, like we right, just met. Right. We've only been here for a while. So I, I think that you know that notion of how to display your curiosity. And if you, if you don't ask questions, you don't really know that this is the right place for you, the right culture for you. Like, th it should take True. weeks for you to really know if a company's really great. And I've got one hour and you're not going to ask me a question. And then worse, right. a lot of times people make the mistake, and I know you've seen this. They're going to ask me a question that they think I want them to ask. Or they're going to give right. me an answer that they think is the answer I want to hear. You know, well, why, you know, right. if I would ask someone, well, why do you want to work here? Oh, because it's a really great company. Okay. I, how do I know it's a great company for you? That's a really unsatisfying answer for me. It's a great company. Right. You know, what's your journey and what, right. what are you going to learn here? And why are you going to choose here? Because if you answer that question, oh, it's a great company. I'm thinking to myself, you're telling everybody that, and you haven't really thought about why you want to work here. And if I hire you, you're probably going to at some point understand who you are a little bit later and you're going to leave. So I want right. to know that there's stickiness, right? In why you're making that choice. True. true, true. No, it's very true. In fact, I feel the higher up you go and in your interview, more than your answers, your questions tells me about more about you. So questions are really important. And then again, the root of all that comes out of curiosity. So if you are curious, automatically you will ask hundreds of questions. And if you're not, then, and, but I think the good point here is if our listeners are listening to us who are, you know, just come out of college and they're giving first interview or second of their life, they should not shy away from asking a lot of questions, even in, you know, even if you are just starting your career, you should do that. And I think that's a very good advice. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. But it is complicated, uh, and, and it is complicated, you know, yeah. when, when it's easy for us to say because we're, you know, we're later in our journey, and we've learned our lessons, right. and we have our scars, we've made our mistakes, and, um, right. but, I, you know, I, it, what is our purpose right now, both of us right now? We are trying to help the people who are just looking at jumping into the pool of their careers yeah. to help try to help Absolutely. them, right? And this, is, the, the, this right. is why I was excited to be on your show because I know you have great passion for this, and I hope your listeners right. really appreciate the commitment that you give uh, to try to help untangle, and also the diversity of perspectives. Because there, you know, I'll tell there is no one right answer to a lot of these questions. You know, uh, just True. like the the first True. one you asked, like, what does a great culture look like? Well, it really depends on the people. And one of my biggest yeah. pet peeves about Silicon Valley, and I have a lot of problems with Silicon Valley, and I live right in the heart here, and right next to Stanford University in Menlo Park, and. One of the biggest mistakes I think a lot of people make is they, oh, we got to go. We want to be like Google. We want to be like Facebook and, and Apple. Let's go visit and learn and do a benchmarking of what they're doing. And I, and I tell them, like, listen, you're not Google. You're not Apple. You're not Facebook. You're not LinkedIn. Take that lessons of what they do, but that fits their business. That fits their people. That fits the founders who are from Russia. I mean, that fits the psychology of what they have. And the most important right. thing is you need to be authentic to who you are. And if you try to be right. another company, it's not going to work, right? And, yes. and, and I think yeah. the, the seduction of, well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be like those great companies. That's nothing wrong with that. But I think they got there because they understood who they were, not because they were trying True. to be somebody else, right? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, – Two points are very important here. Uh, one is, as you said, you have to find out what works for you. And, and I, 
see this thing happening often that people come with waving a book at me <laughs> that you know oh this agile book is written you have to do this way because facebook do this way or netflix does mm -hmm. but you know how many engineers netflix have they have like 15 engineers behind every service why you are trying to copy them so that's one thing is very important to of course for sure try to learn from them but don't just try to go and blindly copy like facebook had this mantra you know break thing fast but it does not mean that you start breaking things in production because facebook said so and in their business is different if i don't see my news feed for a second it doesn't matter if i right. see it stale it doesn't matter but if you are a company who is in serious business you cannot go in that route so that's one of the good good point you bought and second is uh, you are very right that we started this show uh, the reason was i wanted to have access to people like you so if somebody is going for a walk and listening to this podcast it's almost like going for a walk with you so uh, hopefully we will try to spread you know the the experience you have and the wisdom you have to everybody in you know the Great. every corner of the world as such Great. so uh, that's true um so other one other thing uh jumped out to me in your book which was uh, the power is not your knowledge but the real power is your network mm -hmm. and it really spoke to me because uh few of my mentors they keep telling me you have to network more network more uh, so couple of two or three part question is one is uh, what do you mean by networking because people uh, misunderstand networking because if i take it in very selfish manner uh, it's misunderstood so what do you mean by networking and you know networking is more powerful than your knowledge and second part is uh, how we can network in this time of covid when i'm not even able to meet people great great questions and this one took me years to appreciate i was the person who was intimidated i thought networking was a cocktail party or reception with people i didn't know strangers and it felt really uncomfortable and awkward and when you're earlier in career you know you i think you instinctively know I need to meet more people. I need more people to know me and that's going to help me. But you don't know how to achieve it. And I think, you know, what I what I believe is, you know, the let, let's answer the first question. Why are networks important? Networks are important because the world's changing so fast that the more people you have that you know, the more resources you can call on when you inevitably face a new challenge or a new complex situation that you've never experienced before. When I was at LinkedIn and they mm -hmm. said we're going to go public, I'd never taken a company public before. I was terrified, so I called three or four people I knew who had been in human resources and they'd been through an IPO, and that me gave me a little more confidence. It didn't make me excellent at that skill because I I still needed to go through it, but it gave me some more confidence. And and networking is more than just you know helping having someone help you find a job. The the way I define it as easy as I possibly can is networking is helping people you know and asking people you know for help. Now, building a network is different than networking, okay? And I think we all have way more people in our network than sometimes we appreciate. I have, I'll tell you a story of how I got the job at LinkedIn because it is the ultimate of unexpected outcomes. I was working uh, in 2008 at Electronic Arts, and my child was in daycare, my oldest son. And one of the other kids in his daycare was having a birthday party at a kid's amusement park. And as a very busy working man, uh, when you're invited to a weekend of screaming children eating sugar, it doesn't sound like it's going to end well. <laughs> It doesn't right. sound as appetizing as relaxing at home watching a game of football on TV. So mm -hmm. I took my son uh, and we went to this kid's birthday party. While there, walking around the park with other parents, I just started having a casual conversation with a gentleman. He happened to be interviewing with LinkedIn. 
uh, for a job in uh, user experience um, and user interface. And he was a great graphic artist. I didn't know at the time. I said, listen, I help all my friends and people I know negotiate offers because I'm in human resources. This is what we do. I sit on the other side of the table. Would you like some help? He said, sure. So we got on a phone call a couple of times and I helped him understand how to negotiate maybe a better offer. I'm not really sure if I helped him or not. At the end, he took the job and worked at LinkedIn. Well, about a month later, he called me. He said, Steve, I'm over here at LinkedIn. You're super great and really cool. And we're looking for our first head of HR and we've been looking for a year. Would you, would you come and interview for it? And I was like, no, I don't think so. I'm really happy at, at Electronic Arts. I'm, I don't need a job change. And they just relocated me here from Canada. And so I don't think so. And he says, come on, man, you got to at least come over, and have a conversation. And I said, well, okay. Well, I went and interviewed about a week or two later, and I couldn't sleep for two weeks. I was so excited. I was just the opportunity of a mm. lifetime. And I almost didn't do it. But that came to me because I met someone at a kid's birthday party. I offered to help him just because it sounded like that's something I do. And he came at me with this the jewel career opportunity of a lifetime. And right. and that, you know, that's a story that I, I've told again and again. And I have I'm another position in my life. I'm on the board of directors of a company that came to me from a woman I met 20 years before that I'd rejected for a job. But we would we were we made a relationship. She was really interesting. We we traded ideas and information articles for years. And she was a thought partner. She was someone really great. And I was sad that it didn't work out that I wasn't able to hire her. Well, I found my first board of directors job through someone that I had turned down for a job almost tw two well, decades earlier. So this is networking. Right. This is, you never know. It could be where you go to church, where you practice your faith. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be the parents. You know, I spend, I have three teenagers and I spend a lot of time watching my kids play sports, which means I spend a lot of time with the parents of the other players. And I could sit there and be by myself and not say anything. I never do that because I'm curious. Who are you? What do you do? What are you seeing? What's happening? Um, and cool. I, some of the ideas in my book came from sitting at sports events, listening to other parents talk about what they're seeing in the world of work. So this is what, you know, I think we try, we kind of need to destigmatize and we need to dial it down. It's pretty simple. Helping people that you mm. know and asking people that you know for help. And that's really, truly networking. Now, building a network starts with recognizing there's a lot more people in your world that you know than you may think that you do. True, true. So um, one thing I noticed uh, in your answer is about being not networking, but paying forward. Mm -hmm. So if we change the word networking to pay forward, it all becomes easier for everybody. Just pay forward, just help people without looking for, you know, what's in it for me. And that is networking. That's how I see in my mind. Just help whoever you can. And, and at the end of the day, when your time will come, somebody will be there to help you. So I think that's easiest and simplest way to see this. Yeah, and you know, Rafa, there's a book uh, that I would recommend uh, that, I, that was recommended to me by a friend, and, and I love it. And it's by Adam Grant. He's a professor. Mm -hmm. uh, have you heard of Adam? He's written many uh, bestseller books. He's a professor at University of Pennsylvania. He's like mm -hmm. a psychologist, uh, super interesting. He's a TED Talk speaker. Anyway, he wrote a, mm -hmm. he's just published another book, but he wrote one a few years ago called Give and Take. And mm -hmm. what he studied was the patterns of highly successful people. And he categorized people into three uh, dimensions. There's givers, there's takers, and there's givers and takers. So hmm. givers, people that just give unconditionally, there's takers who take and never give, and there's people that do both. Right. And he said, um, which, you know, which one readers, he asked the reader, which one do you think would be more successful? And so when my friend asked me this, um, it's a friend of mine in France, I said, oh, definitely givers and takers. People, that, people are doing both. And he says, wrong. I said, really? I said, please tell me it's not the takers. <laughs> he said, it's the givers. Uh, and you know, whether it is because of karma or, or whatever, but givers tend to elevate more because more people want them to be successful. 
and it re- right. it's a great book, you know. And he also said that there's some givers that give too much, and they don't they're not successful. So there there is a limit. But but he studied these people, and he and he gave a lot of really good examples. And I would I would ask people like first, you know, you know someone in your world who's a taker. You ask mm. them for help, they never call you back. But when they need something, they're asking you. Right. And you know, I noticed something when I was the head of human resources for one of the hottest companies uh, after we went IPO in Silicon Valley, LinkedIn was super, super hot. My phone was ringing all the time. When I retired from that position, my true friends were still calling me, but the people true. who were just looking to take because I was in this fancy company with a fancy title, they disappeared. Right. And their take yeah. taker status became pretty clear to me. <laughs> Can right, you can you right. relate no, to that? that? You know those people? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was in Seattle when I left Microsoft. Suddenly people stopped replying to your email, <laughs> returning your call. But I feel, uh, you know, it's a matter of time because everybody is in this journey of growth and they'll grow one day. And hopefully all the takers will move to the giver part. Uh, with with time, right? Yeah, right. So, Steve, I still would like to know if you have any idea how you can do this networking in this time of COVID, uh, where it's difficult to meet new people as such. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and and um, I, I think there's there are places where where you can do this, and um, I think there are, there are forums that you can join. There are chat rooms. Uh, I've I experimented a little bit with Clubhouse. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting to me, and because you could just listen in from the side and go, "Wow, that's an interesting person. I want to get to know them." Boom, and you, and you right. try to reach out. And um, what, what I would say is, you know, are there are there people that you want to learn from? And you know, there are there places where they're hanging out. You know, what are they doing, and and where are they going? And we we do live in this black uh, black mirror reality right now, where it feels less like we're going to informally bump into someone. So I, I guess right. my advice is right now, we're still, it's still like a, a new frontier, if you will. And I think we're still experimenting. So go, tr- cool. go try to, you know, try to identify the places where the people that might be interesting for you, where are they spending their time? Are they online gaming? Are they, right. you know, wh- where are they? Th- from, from my perspective, I mean, I'm a tennis player. I love to play tennis. Uh, and we're, we're able to do that again in, in California for the most part. And mm-hmm. I try to do that once a week or every other week. And I'm, and it's usually the, the clubs where I play, it's, you show up and you're matched with somebody and you play doubles. So you meet three new people. Um, and over the course of a morning, you can meet as many as 10 or 15 people. And I'm always like, you know, what do you do? What, you know, what are you involved with? And that's how I've been, mm-hmm. you know, filling, filling that, or okay. just y- y- the other thing, and let's just talk about how you and I are now networked. So you and I True. met. I was just wondering about that right. after us. Right, you. right. So here, so here yeah. we are. I, you know, I'm out in the universe talking about right. things that I like to talk about. And that's, yes. you know, I, I was convinced by some college students to try TikTok, and they were very right. They were way more right than I thought right. they would be that there's an audience there that was willing to listen to you. Now, where is the place right. that you want to talk or where's the place you want to write or publish or whatever? But if you do right. that, people that have similar interests like you will find you. And then boom, True. now 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 we've got a connection and you know, off right. air, you and I had a delightful conversation where we found a lot of commonalities right. around interests and people and and perspectives, right? And so True. that's that's yeah. special, right? And so here we here we are. This yes. is a, we're a living example, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Uh, so, Steve, I wanted to ask you one question because this phenomena I have just seen uh, in some companies. So we had this, you know, three hundred and sixty degree feedback once in a year or once in you know every six month. Looks great. I think it's good. A lot of value to it. But now I'm seeing. Uh, in, in some very big companies, especially in Seattle, that they are like taking it to extreme where every day they are sending two, three questions to the, uh, you know, every employee. It's kind of almost micromanaging the 
managers because they were asked, are you happy with your job? Are you liking your manager? Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this phenomena of taking this feedback thing and squeezing it to every day? Well, I do think that um, it's important today, generally, for us to be communicating and pulsing people more. Because I, mm -hmm. I do believe that the workforce and companies are both more worried about the future than at any time in history. We, w things are changing so fast. We have less certainty about the future. What skills do we need? Uh, what new competitor can come out of the woodwork? Because what it costs and the time it takes to build a competitive company is far less than it's ever been. Uh, and so there's mm. a lot. There's more out of our control. So uh, my advice to people is to please raise the cadence of asking people. Now, there's a difference between asking for people with the expectation that you're going to action it immediately and, and fix something, right? Like that's the, the right. old annual employee survey. It's anonymous. Right. Give us feedback on what we can do better, what we're working on that's, that, is, that you want us to continue. And then we'll come back to you and give you the results. And then we're going to take two or three things and try to, try to change them and two or three things and make sure we don't change them. Um, and so I, I think I, jo I jokingly tell companies, if you're surveying your employees once a year, you're not surveying your employees like that. It's just you're not listening because the world of work's changing so fast that you can kind of get a pulse. What, what I do like is organizations, if they're if they really care, like and, and, and they serve like an Uber message. When you leave the office today, are you feeling inspired? Do you feel like you made a difference just to have a point of reference? And now the, in, in a world where. I may feel more disconnected from my organization because I'm not in the building. I'm not maybe bumping into people. I don't have the social fabric that's reinforcing maybe a connection to something. I think organizations may be worried, and that's why they're they're that's why I think this is happening more. Um, if it if it mm. feels like you're being overwhelmed or bombarded or like hey hey you know quit it's like. Do you, like, you remember when you were a teenager and you would come home from school and your mom was like, what happened? What did the teacher? And you just said, mom, mom, I, just, I don't want to talk to you right now. Like, leave me alone. Right. Uh, I had this exact conversation with my son last night about his college. Out. What's happening? How many, have you figured out who you're applying? And he said, whoa, dad, it's, it's a few months away. I'm like, no, it's going to. And so, okay, he's not ready for this. I'll wait. Right. I'm planting the seed in his head that I'm thinking about him. Yes, my parental worry Ooh. is kicking in. He's not in a place where he's ready to talk about it. And I think we have to be sensitive to uh, that. I would, rather, I, would, I would rather work for a company that's asking more than not asking right now. That I would. Mm -hmm. I would rather be with a company that's more concerned about my welfare. Uh, you know, do I have an immunocompromised family member? Do I have kids that aren't getting educated in the way that I think is right? That's going to distract me mm -hmm. from delivering value. I would rather have someone over-index on that right now than under-index on that. But I think you're, right. what's behind your question is, are we thoughtfully delivering that or are we just bombarding people? You know, what is the purpose? Are you explaining to people, hey, right. we're going to ask you every day when you go home, we're going to serve you up a Uber like five star, you know, in your in your in your um, mobile phone just for feedback. Right. And we just want to get a pulse that's going to make us lead you and guide you better. That's why we're doing this. And if you think we've got, we can ask better questions or you think we can ask it less or more, please let us know, right? I think that's, right. that's a good thing. And interestingly enough, uh, I, get, I, I get to cross paths with a lot of the uh, VC community here because I coach a lot of their kids in sports and so forth. So you cross paths, not because I'm seeking it out, but just because of the general nature of the crazy uh, part of the world that I live in. And one of the highest invested domains in the last 10 years is the domain of companies building feedback collection technology and, and mm -hmm. leveraging artificial intelligence so that we can get insights. One company in right. particular did something really, really interesting, which, which I'll share with the listeners really quickly. They, they, were, they were asking themselves, when we talk to our employees through corporate communication, through company meetings, are we consistent with our culture? And what they did was they did a language analysis of what were all the words that were being used most frequently. And they, to mm. their surprise, discovered language insights that were inconsistent with some of the values of the company. And so it was just an mm. interesting, I'd never seen someone go that deep. Yeah. Like our, how we speak about 
whatever we're speaking about, the organization decisions or things like that. And we have so much technology now to, to really reveal patterns and, and, you know, so, so I think we're, 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 we're sort of at this new frontier of how do we leverage that in a way that doesn't feel creepy or intrusive or distracting, but does reveal insights that are going to help us help build a great company. Right. True. True. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I know I've taken a lot of your time, but I have just one last question sure. I would like to know. As you know, the, you know, the team uh, goes through these four stages of development, right? Forming, storming, norming, norming and performing. And performing, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I know in your life you have done many acquisitions, uh, acquired the companies, blended the different cultures, built the teams from ground up. So I would like to know if you have some tips to bring the team out of this norming and storming stages to quickly to performing stage. Is there something people can do to bring the team quickly to the performing stage and shrink the you know storming and forming stages? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and that was. The very question we asked ourselves at Cisco in the four years I was doing merger and integration work, uh, mm. merger and acquisition integration, we worked on 50 deals. And that was the whole goal. We have to get them through this crazy change process so they're delivering value on the other side as fast as possible. What we found right. were pro- problems that we could solve, built trust fast. And so right. uh, that, that's why you know we have the greatest opportunity today in the pandemic to show what we're made of. It's in crisis and challenge and difficulty where your people see what you're made of, how, how you respond. What are you taking? What are you paying attention to? How do you communicate? What's your mood? Are you stressed out and angry and sharp and bitter and very quick to bite back? Or are you calmer? Mm. Are you listening more? Are you asking people, are you, are you well? Are you, are you checking in with someone's human, the life of someone before you start talking about their goals and deliverables and quarterly results? This is a moment right. in time. So one of the things that I learned getting through that phase fast is to build trust. You need an opportunity for someone to see what you're really made of. And so, for example, mm. when we would acquire a company in the United States, inevitably someone would come during the integration and say, I have a family member who's getting special medical care right now. It's very expensive. Uh, on your medical plan that we have to move to, the doctor that we're seeing is not on your plan. What are you going to do? Um, so, that you know, we would solve the problem. We would say, absolutely, there's a way that we can do that. We're, we're going to grandfather your doctor in, and, um, and we're going to let you do that. So these are the experiences that I think can um, – really you can leverage during a difficult time to get through the storming mm. and performing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, Steve. I'm grateful that you took, you know, an hour of your time to speak with us and hopefully for our listeners, they will be benefiting by your experiences. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to hopefully being invited back sometime in the future. <laughs>